to bring to you some very, very interesting uh, work by Akshat Bhatt. Uh, and he's going to show to us and talk in detail about what all is done. So we'll just wait a while. So good afternoon once again. Um, happy to have you all join us. Let me begin by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Nancy L, and I head the uh, Department of Design at GSID. Today we are going to meet a very experienced, very interesting uh, architect and interior designer uh, who's going to be showing some of his projects which he thinks are, going, are really landmark projects for his experience and for us as well. So that's Akshat Bhatt, Principal Architect at Architecture Discipline. Uh, a short, a few brief uh, information about him. He graduated from the TVB School of Habitat Studies in 2002, then studied at the University of East London. Uh, completing, after he completed his studies, he worked with Penoyar and Pasadanan Kahane and Associates in London. He started his, he, uh, his own firm called Architecture Discipline in 2007. It's a multidisciplinary design studio that explores architecture through the scales of urban design, architecture, public art, installations, furniture, and product design. I'm gonna ask um, Akshat to give us some time uh, before he, so uh, Aksha, just a few words to say hello and what all you've done, and then we'll move on to your first project. Aksha, you will have to unmute your mic. Your speaker is off, yes. Right, perfect. Yes. So I'm the principal of architecture discipline or the founding principal now, in the firm Stone Beyond Me. Um, We've done many things over the last 10 odd years, or a little over a decade, and um, Make in India happens to be one of them. Uh, we, we've also done some uh, very, very high, what is considered high technology work in architecture, such as a hotel called Mana at Ranakpur, um, a town hall called the Discovery Center at Bangalore, which can be dismantled, which is a one lakh square foot building that can be dismantled and moved every eight months, every eight years. And it takes about eight months to assemble. And after which, or around that same time, we also started doing, uh, well, lots of residential work, but um, a lot of um, a, a lot of um, um, a lot of hospitality and um, hospitality work for uh, clients like Taj and Oberoi. Um, and our speciality is in developing, in using new construction techniques and technology to make buildings that that not only, to make buildings differently, that don't not only look different, but also last longer. Uh, as we learned that, the studio also sort of spreads itself into not only a, a very cutting edge modern expression, but also uh, looks at reinventing old things to see how there are some, there is some historical significance or some uh, or a lot of historical significance to things from the past and how do you how do you recreate that even though you don't have the same tools and technology available to you today and how do you keep it relevant thank you so uh, while we are at it uh, let me uh, announce that you are welcome to put in your question and answers uh, we will be taking that up at the end of the sessions so please feel free ask akshat as many questions he's here to talk to you today um, we move on to the first polling question. Now, the idea is that we want to know how much do you know about what's happening in the field of interior design and architecture? Uh, these are very simple questions for people who may not be involved. Okay, even if you are a novice, these questions, you may be knowing about it. So, for example, what, is, what are the 2020 trends in interior design? Please go ahead, fill it up, and let's see what everybody thinks. So 
So I believe, Akshat, that uh, uh, trails have become quite an important part of interior space. Uh, one didn't realize that it is as soon as almost one year. Is it that every year trends change? And if that is so, then I guess there is a big, there, there is a lot of reason and rational why things are happening at this fast speed. Because sometimes uh, an in, a building and an interior can take as much as six months to eight, eight months to come up. Okay, here are the answers and you will have to tell us whether that really is true or not. So 60% have said sustainability and 38% have said colors inspired by nature. And of course, bling and gold is just 2%. So these are the results of 2020 trends in interior design. Yes, please tell us, Akshar. Do you think that's correct? Um, I think if we run through this short presentation, one might be able to exemplify my answer. Right. Let me let me try and share okay. what I have here. So I'm just going to quickly uh, ask you a few things. So for example, like we mentioned earlier, trends in interior design is very fast paced nowadays. Would you say the project that you're going to show us now, which is on Trump Gallery, do you think trends sort of influenced the kind of work, you, uh, work uh, that you did for the Trump's gallery? Or if not, then how did you start? What was your process? Okay, so I'm going to have to run through the, to the Trump gallery first. Let's yeah. see if that would entail me skipping a few things here. Um, look, I honestly believe that trends while trends do change and they do emerge and disappear. Now that's the Trump gallery and uh, actually it, it encompasses all three elements that you're talking about, sustainability, uh, the a sort of glamorous space and a lot of gold and bling. Oh, it does. Uh, so it, 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 uh, so fundamentally we have to understand that um, that glamour and luxury is not about only gold and bling. It's about the pursuit of excellence and finesse and longevity. We tend to be, trends tend to be the, the, driven by a, uh, a, a system or, a, or, a, or an industry that needs to, that, that is in a need for refreshment or in a, is in a need to keep regenerating itself. Uh, is it is in any is it's transactionary in nature, which means people need to buy things for an industry to survive. People need to keep redoing things, but that does not mean you make things that are not timeless. So the Trump Gallery is an example of a space that's that's got that that ticks all the boxes that you were talking about. Yet it's a space that's light, airy, lofty, has a positive and optimistic feel to it and is uh, is contextual because you can see there are some patterns and materials that are used that that feel that they that reflect a little bit of india in it yet there's a lot there's a huge international character to it when we go into the space we are proud of saying that it's a space that can be completely recycled is made of a lot of non first use material even though it's a trump space and the quality of air inside the space is a is is, has a PM count of one, which is the highest level of purity you can get. It consumes less energy than most such spaces. It uses less wiring and less air conditioning by 10 times than a space of this size. So sustainability becomes important because you have to do things for A, them to last, and B, to leave space for other people to do things in future, which means after we're gone. Sustainability is also important because that allows, it's a guiding factor for you to make things that don't need to be remade very quickly. So a thing should typically last and, and a space should last a couple of generations, if not more. That is important even for its aesthetic. Uh, but what's the point of doing that if it feels like it's old fashioned or boring or does not give you the right positive energy or impetus that you need to have? 
So let's remember that eventually most people who are sharing and, and experiencing your space are not technical people. They're not designers. They're not architects. They just need to feel a certain way when they're in a space. So you have to, and I think the one most important criteria to make people feel is for them to make, for you to make them feel positive and energized when they enter your space. Um, and that's where the quality of space and adding a little bit of adding a touch that makes them feel special uh, is important. True. I, I, just, I was just wondering whether you think sustainability will also have its own trends within that. So one year it could be something more, maybe nature, the other would be in recycling, upcycling. What do you think? Just, Sustainability is a dynamic uh, concept uh, and uh, it, it changes and evolves every year over and over again. So it's not static in any which way. Um, and that because if you can't consume too much of any one thing or do too much of any one thing for it, uh, because then it's, it's against the idea of being sustainable. You, it's, it's about controlling uh, consumption. And that by its very nature means when you introduce new things, or, or a slightly differentiated thing and differentiated ideas, uh, you are going to uh, you're going to have to change your aesthetic because as your tools change and your technology changes, your expression changes. Mm -hmm. So there was a time when we were using a lot of local material, local fabric. Mm -hmm. Then there came a time when we used where you know the, the raw materials and the skill available to make them was was scarce, so you couldn't use it. Then came a time when you had to start. Uh, uh, when and and therefore we were using things from abroad. Then came a time where those things from abroad were used to mimic what is local, uh, because people had got bored of a certain kind of expression uh, over many many decades. Then everybody didn't want everything to look the same. So yes, there are inherent cycles in everything, mm -hmm. but I don't think sustainable development is a question, because as our population increases. And as our cities grow, we are consuming more and more. Therefore, we have to be conscious of how we use and reuse things and how we create them. True. So are we saying that sustainability is a way to work, is the way of life, and is the way we live. So irrespective of whatever, whatever time span, it is a part of how we are going to go ahead. That's interesting. Yes. There is no question about it. Okay. Uh, just some very simple question about Trump. Where is this located? Uh, the Trump Gallery is uh, at the Oberoi uh, in Gurgaon. And it was a space made for Trump Jr. as a temporary office when he visited India for two weeks. Is it still existing? Yes, it's existing. Uh, it, the entry is by invite only. Oh. Thank you. That was quite an insight into Trump Gallery. Um, I'm going to move on to, uh, I think, uh, Akshat, can we move ahead with the slides? Because there's a polling question we'd like to ask our participants. Mm -hmm. so okay. If there's anything else you may like to point out, that would be interesting too. Well, I think in this particular space, what I just look to, what I, what I think people should look at is how clean a space like this is how you have a curtain, which is, you know, I think this is eight and a half meters tall and how it falls almost perfectly. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain amount of finesse uh, in, in execution and quality. Mm -hmm. And we tend, I think there is a lot of em emphasis on how you make things well. Now making things well is not just about the training of the person who's making it. It's also about the inherent training of the designer who has to have the ability to understand how to make something well and communicate that. Uh, and yes, of course, you know, to understand how you absorb sound, how do you absorb light, how do you create enough light in an ambience for there to be not too much contrast, not too many shadows. So if mm -hmm. we go back, you see there are no shadows in this space. Um, Correct. And of course, about some technical detailing and so on and so forth. Thank so you yes, for explaining a... such details to us. Okay, uh, we are at the next poll question. So. What makes an interior design iconic? I think this is something probably many of us would just guess at it. So is it aesthetics and function, furniture and lighting, 
or glitz and technology. So please go ahead and let's see what the participants come up with. Our next project uh, that I'm going to ask you questions on, Akshat, is, is the interior of the Obroy Grand at Kolkata. And there, there is, of course, oh, there it is, the pole too. Uh, okay, we are still waiting for it. Um, so let's take, get the answers and we can proceed then with the discussion on Obroy Grand. So, Okay, the participants say aesthetics and furniture and function is 68%, a very high number. The next group says furniture and lighting is 18% of the participants agreeing to that. Glitz and technology, 14%. So really the highest is aesthetics and function. So is that what makes an interior design um, iconic? What do you think, Akshay? Well, yes, I think um, I think it goes without saying that the you you the your first engagement with something is visual. You know, if you don't want to enter it, or you don't want to go close to it, then you would not. Uh, and your second engagement with something is how you operate within it. So that's function. Uh, so both together are what makes something uh, timeless or iconic. And that goes without saying, uh, but as, but those rules change, you know, as, uh, as your tools and technology changes, so does your need, but what does not change is the need for inspiration and the need for, you know, new technique. Sure. So I have some information. I don't know. You might like to add on to it. So what I know is that the Obroy Grand was at Kolkata was refurbished after 50 years and is graded at the highest level of protection, which means conservation, I'm told, which is equivalent to that of Rashtrapati Bhavan. Well, we didn't know all these details, but it seems quite amazing that there are possibly many buildings or monuments in the country having such high level of protection, as you say it. Uh, and that means, I was wondering, how did you take on this challenge, which was to be graded at that level? And if you were to look at designing the interior for it, did you, were you looking at aligning it for a particular just performance? Or is it the, the whole value that it was meant to be projecting? If you could help us understand what you did. Um, so when you have a grade one listed building, there's very little you can touch. You can't, uh, you cannot, you can't change the material of the building or any of the elements that go into the building. You can't change the, uh, you can definitely not change the form or the facade or uh, the structure in any which way. Uh, and, and you have to almost go, you have to address it like a conservation building. So it has to look, feel, behave mm -hmm. like the way, like, as if it was made, as it was made the very first day. You know, that's the, the reason for conserving your history. Uh, so what we've done here is you know, for this particular project is we've, um, is that we have used uh, cutting edge parametric and computer techniques to, um, to assess what the building had uh, historically. That I mean, of course, your first stages are always going over everything with the, with a pencil and a paper, you know, trying to study things, investigate things by breaking them, doing some probes, doing some tests, and then, you know, taking photographs and keeping a record and making drawings. But after that, you assess everything um, using, uh, you formulate and assess and, and recreate everything using computers and CNC techniques. And that's what allows us to create spaces like this, which are actually made with the same material and the same techniques as they were historically, yet add another layer altogether, which celebrates the history and also celebrates it's coming into a new era. Um, of course, things like this have to be made and have to now perform for, uh, for contemporary times, which means 
today we're not we're we're uncomfortable if the air conditioning is anything over 22 degrees we're uncomfortable if the walls are not absolutely smooth we're uncomfortable if the if the if there are water droplets in the air we're uncomfortable if there is a smell and of course pollution in the air is a is a is a now that we're aware of it is a very big deal so uh, the building and the construction techniques of the building are very are extremely conscious of it yet we're conscious of the fact that somebody who's coming in today into a place like this is absolutely um, wants a slightly fresh experience so you bring that in and you also bring in the memory of the old experience into a space like this sure uh, and of course natural light so we've we while we conserve the existing structure and the existing technology the overall expression of the interior now is is timeless and uh, contemporary at the same time so do you think they are going to take another few more decades before they go in for another interior overhaul yes given today's performance criteria given that it's a public building you know mm-hmm. it's a hotel with a very high tariff and it's uh, it's something that needs to you know so doing any kind of work in a running in an operating running existing hotel is very difficult because the people sleeping there they're there all the time so you have very limited working hours your entire your your focus on doing something has to be very swift and very and very precise once you've done that you've put in that energy and you invested that kind of money you need it to last long and that's where the technical ability you know there is a lot you have to invest in yourself creatively but you also have to take the responsibility of delivering something technically sound to a client which is as prestigious as this because there are tremendous health and safety issues that are often ignored in countries like ours when we do space like this but when you have europeans and foreigners and and dignitaries visiting a space like this uh, so for example this is a hotel ready for the president this is a hotel where uh, people like amitabh bachchan and sachin tendulkar stay every time they visit calcutta uh, so you have to ensure that the performance criteria are very strong and the longevity criteria are very strong both aesthetically and functionally correct so there are a lot of things to be taken care of uh, but i had a question about do you i know you worked you probably worked on other hospitality or other hotels as well what would be the difference uh, in the way of working for uh, iconic buildings such as the kolkata grand versus other franchisee hotels um i think usually franchisee properties there, there is a, are not as are not you see most franchisee properties are working off a catalog right so you've already been given a book where certain things are determined that's a brand standard and that's a minimum standard for something uh, any standard is the minimum criteria that has to be met it may be a very high standard but it's the minimum criteria uh, when you work with a brand like an oberoi it's because it is driven by a legendary owner who is involved himself and who is 90 years old has so much experience uh, and then it's run the, the second in command are his own sons and nephews who are also equally experienced and equally uh, aware uh, and they take pride in their family name you have to take care of everything so in this case there's a lot of finesse in your experience you know in not just how an interior or a space looks but even how a space performs mm-hmm. where are the night switches where are those switches what kind of switches am i it has to perform incredibly well but it should be absolutely unobtrusive because you want everything to get out of your way yet be there um, simple things like what you know everybody says you know automatic night lights when you step down the light comes on at the foot of the bed it's very easy to do mm-hmm. but when you have a night light at that point you are you are that that night that light is only carrying you forward so much more often than not a hotel room is occupied by either a married couple or by a a individual alone what do you do at home when you have to get out of your bed you reach out for the night lamp mm-hmm. so while everything else is on the wall the night lamp the bell switch is on the lamp so now there are two ways to do it either you reach out 
to a chain or you reach out to a bell switch. And so even considering where that goes, how high the side table is compared to the mattress that you're sleeping on is important for a project like this. Uh, so that there are no, so that you're instantly comfortable and you feel at home or you feel, or you feel comfort that is better than your home when you walk in. And uh, last but not the least, you avoid any accidents. You know, you can imagine mm -hmm. someone getting injured in a place like this yeah. is a huge liability. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. This is, uh, but I just have one more question for this particular project because I'm sure a lot of the participants listening to us, uh, they either are working in the area of interiors and they would be very curious to know, what about the furnishings? I mean, when you say the quality of everything else, infrastructure in the place, you talked about it. Could you help us understand about the fabrics and colors for that or how, what do you do for that? Well, there are some very basic considerations. First, you have to take those off, you know, how, how will something last? Not mm -hmm. just last when it comes to staining and so on and so forth. As, as you'll see here, these are flat fabrics. These are flat blue, velvet like fabric right? mm -hmm. but the criteria for specifying and finding such fabric is a of course you test that it works with a certain kind with this is a bar so you'll have coffee spilling on it you'll have drinks spilling on it you'll have all kinds but you have to be able to clean it very quickly it has to be uh, it has to work against wear and tear and remember that you can't have stores and store of inventory so that if something goes bad, you replace it. You can have only maybe 10% of furniture spare to replace or repair <coughs> or, uh, or substitute for a while. Mm -hmm. So you use the highest level of, say, wear count. The wear count is determined by a Martindale. So, for example, a public area like this would mm -hmm. have a 50,000 Martindale fabric, which, is, which means that you want <coughs> excuse me, your fabrics to look and feel new mm -hmm. for at least 10 years. Okay. And also remember that uh, because you don't want to invest time, space, energy also, I think there's a lot, there's a huge trend today to make things look old already. Okay. You know, so there are distressed finishes are in vogue. Uh, what we learned with projects like this is that a place will age in five years, 10 years, 15 years. We have to be able to predict the aging. But when I am paying so much money and I'm walking into a public space. Mm -hmm. I expect not only hygiene, I expect to feel like things are hygienic. So you want to avoid using super trendy things like, oh, I'm using a distress finish. No, you can't do that. You can use a technique to make it look engaging without making it look old. So our objective in a project like uh, a high star hotel is to always have it look new. Okay. Always have it look fresh. Well, those are the trips for all the young uh, designers over here. Um, I think we now come to our next poll. So here it goes. Why are conservation projects important? And I think many of the architects, uh, of course, work on conservation projects. And I'm very sure interior designers would have opportunities too. And the answers are sustaining the history of a place. Uh, promote it as a tourist destination and preserving the built cultural heritage. So let's see what our participants say about this. So what I get from uh, your profile is, Akshat, you've done a, quite a few projects in conservation and some of them are very large scale. It's not just maybe about a building or a monument. Uh, and that's what we are interested to hear. What your take is, how do you see those projects? Is it, is, does the context seem very important to you? So we will talk about the Jodhpur project, but I'm just waiting for the polling to come back to us and we'll see what, what are the participants saying? Okay, um, large number saying 60% saying preserving the built cultural her heritage. 35% are saying it's sustaining the history of a place. And of course, just 5% saying that this is to promote tourism. Um, Akshat, I'm sure while you are talking about your project, you would be addressing this, but uh, 
I wanted to understand whether uh, taking on so many conservation projects is, is it because something's driving you to look at these projects differently and you seem to have worked quite a few on many such projects. So we'd like to know what you have, what you have been thinking. So, uh, well, I can sum it up in one line, right? Today there are, and it says that on the slide also, there's a, there's a huge world of redundant structures and technologies and spaces that are, that can be transformed into something that is meaningful again. We tend to ignore them. There is, this is not something new. There is, there are, there is huge design theory books written on it. Uh, and there are differences between something called a pathological monument and a paleolithic monument. That goes by what, as what it says, a paleolithic monument is something that is dead. It does not exist, that does not harbor any life in it or around it. A pathological monument is a monument that serves society, which means, well, if you go to the Red Fort in Delhi, there are people inside it. If you go to the Tughlaqabad Fort, it is not just a dead fort wall, there are people within it. Whereas the old fort, for example, is paleolithic, there's no one, there's no life around it. Horse cars, Charni Chowk, these are all examples of pathological monuments. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we tend to disregard them. Uh, we tend to treat them poorly. So what we've done for the JDH project was we actually did this was a self-funded project where we collaborated with the royal family and we um, earmarked an area. We earmarked an area which is the oldest old city of Jodhpur from the uh, grain market all the way to the Mehrangar port which is about 60 kilometers of 60 square kilometers of area uh, where we picked nodes. We selected certain nodes and we decided to refle refle refresh them, replenish them. So um, this was our first few studies. So you see there was a, there was a bowli, which was, or a step well, which was used as a dumping ground. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent two and a half months and a few lakh rupees to sandblast it, clear it out, send out dump, you know, uh, tractor load after tractor load of rubbish and eventually it became a clean uh, space which is now which now has fresh water it's a self-regenerating system so this is not water that we have put in it's groundwater that keeps cleaning itself now there are fish here there was no life in it there are fish and now it's become a tourist destination it's a democratic space where poor and rich people all sort of uh, congregate and celebrate together it becomes a tourist destination it also becomes a space where you can add some new elements to preserve or to, to continue the history of the space. Finally, every night, you know, rather than relying on technology and lights, we, we pay someone 5,000 rupees to go and put diyas in every niche. So at a, with a small amount of money, you know, there's nothing that can replicate the warmth and energy of a diya. And yet, uh, and we didn't, you don't have to rely on complicated answers every time. Some of the, some of the, some of the, some of the most memorable things are simple. And we, use a small radio, a small uh, speaker to run the chants of Shiva mm -hmm. into this step well every day. And it reverberates and the entire village enjoys the sound and they all congregate and it, it's almost like a merit, it becomes a meditative space at night. So through the day, it's an, in, it's an interactive space and a space for activity by people jumping in the water. And at night, it becomes a space where people come and contemplate. Uh, it became the most tweeted thing on Instagram uh, we also hired some local artists to do cartographs. Uh, we created an information center in the form of a cafe. So people can actually go there and uh, get, well, why they can buy an inexpensive coffee. Uh, they can also learn about the history of the place. So it's, um, it, it's, 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 a, it's not a, it's not a enterprise for profit, but it's an enterprise for self, for sustaining itself. Uh, so this guys in the information center as a cafe makes it more interesting to people who are not interested necessarily in information. Or you can go and visit it even if you've got the information you need, but the energy remains. Uh, as you can see inside here, there's some, there's, there's paintings from the old family. There's a little, there's a little, uh, there's a little time, uh, timeline for Jodhpur and how things happened here. And of course, then even that for us became a very tweeted uh, uh, and spoken about thing. And to give you another example, there's a small Haveli, which mm -hmm. was this over the years, the family, had, you know, it had gone through decay, family change. It mm -hmm. looked like this and it wasn't a very inviting space. It was just mm -hmm. cleaned out and relit. And today this house is Good Earth and uh, Nicobar. We also, what we also did here is we programmed 
what we believe are the best Indian brands that hold the essence of India, such as Nicobar, uh, Good Earth, um, Forest Essentials, and those are then they sort of cleaned out. And so, you know, so everything is given out as a cheap hotel, but even was given out in the past as a cheap hotel, low level tourism. But then we we refurbished it and we sort of reprogrammed it for it to become a little more enriching which then motivates the people around it, the surroundings, to also do something similar and not just treat these as little dingy cubby holes like they were in the past. Uh, they were never meant to be, but they became that. I can really see how passionate you feel about this. Uh, where else do you think such projects have been converted into you know, play, public places which can be contemporary and are used by are being used in a, you know, in the normal social manner. Oh, uh, there is another project we've done in Delhi, which is uh, a place called the Dhanmil Com Complex, where uh, some people may have visited a place called Napa Dori Cafe. We have, we are partners in a non-profit enterprise called the Common Room, which is a place for young people to go seek mentorship, seek ideas. You can meet industry leaders there, and it's all for free. Um, there is another place called Motherland, which we've done in the Daniel compound, which is the Motherland magazine, which talks, of, which is a magazine for all that is unique to India in terms of culture and trends and whatnot, which is not pure commercial enterprise, but it is about the depth and richness of our culture, uh, not in a mummified old fashioned way, but presented in a way which is new. So there's, there's always opportunity and I think, and we're always open to people reaching out to us for, uh, you see, I mean, I think one of the abilities we found is to be, once we work with a certain kind of client set and you spend more than a decade setting up an office in a certain way uh, with high standards, you can always take those standards and percolate them down to, a, to, a, to an easier level. So passing our learnings from a hotel on to a public space is, is, is what we try and do without trying to make the public space feel like a hotel. Thank you. And uh, Akshat, there are so many questions by the participants. So if you are ready, I'm going to ask you one by one and perhaps some more, uh, some more of these questions are going to throw up light on uh, what your experience and how, what do you think about that? Uh, many on sustainability, I can see that. So Sakshi is asking, which materials are most easy to recycle? Um, I know a technical question. Question. Anything that has a long life, mm -hmm. so materials such as steel and glue laminated timber can be recycled. If something is manufactured in a module, it can be recycled. And then there are materials such as cardboard, carbon fiber, that are biodegradable. That can also be recycled, but they're in a different way. So uh, I think bio, uh, I, I rate reusability mm. higher than recyclability. So when mm. you reuse something, you can reuse it in a different way uh, and you save a lot more. Recycling also entails by its very nature a new process, right? So. Um, and we tend to misunderstand certain things. Uh, a glass cold drink bottle, a glass Coca-Cola bottle is a reusable bottle. A plastic Coca-Cola bottle, which is recyclable, is recycled. It is cut into its basic form and reformed. It is not reused. Glass bottle is cleaned and reused and refilled. So that's, I mean, and I think we should always be aware of those things when we're working. Concrete is the least recyclable material. Plaster of Paris is the least recyclable material. Gypsum board is least recyclable. I think the most commonly used materials in our bending industry are not reusable or recyclable. And that's actually the problem. We must understand that the construction industry is responsible for 70% of the pollution in this world. Whereas it is only the other 30% is that of the other 30%, 20% is attributed to the transportation industry. Uh -huh. So another question on sustainability. Uh, Sarika is asking, how can you use sustainable 
upcycled or recycled designs and still make them look beautiful and trendy. I think that's really dependent on your skill set. I think you have to always set the benchmark to understand how is something going to look timeless? How is it going to be, how is it going to make me feel optimistic? I think often people tend to associate recycled, recycled and recyclable materials with things that look junky and may I say tacky in some ways, right? So you have to, I, I think a lot of how you make something, how you design something is based on your skill set and your values. And remember, never oversell a value, even though you're compromising on the longevity and aesthetic of something. And by longevity, I also mean aesthetic longevity. I can make something that looks very good for five minutes or five, five, five days. It's not set design because if it's only going to look good for such a short period of time, you, your entire effort of trying to conserve on it is wasted because someone's going to get bored of it or is going to get sick of it and is going to want to recycle it or, or change it. Correct. So coming to that, there are some questions on trends and uh, they're asking how much should you rely on trends when designing a space, but also how can we keep us updated with the trends changing every year? Um, I think one of the things that are, that's very important with trends is that you have to ignore them. <laughs> um, you have to, you have to make sure that what you do has its own unique set of values. Uh, they have to fit into a set of universal values of, mm -hmm. and those universal values are very well established and you're taught all that in school and, you know, from first year to fifth year always. Um, but your, uh, you have to stick to those. Those are your fundamental barometers for, for, for understanding something. Then come value systems that are your own, which is your own unique story and your own technique and uh, uh, you know, the way you address things in, with a certain quality. Uh, then come trends. Now trends are, trends are not, I think it's a very abused term. I think one has to keep an eye out for emergent uh, technologies for emergent materials, which means till a few years ago, we were not using carbon fiber in the construction industry. Today, carbon fiber is cheaper than steel for us, for the kind of projects we do. Uh, we were, concrete was an emerging trend in the 1920s. Today, steel is re-emerging as a reusable material, but steel is older than concrete in the construction industry that dates back to 1800s. So, like I said, these things are, 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 are cycles, you know, it's a bit like bell-bottom jeans. They were there in the 70s. And they came back in the late 90s, but in a slightly yeah. different way. Absolutely. And wow. also remember, people who are fashionable can always pull it off, whatever <laughs> they're wearing. Yeah. But not everybody. <laughs> not everybody. Okay, and there comes a question on Vastu Shastra. How can one incorporate Vastu Shastra in the architecture, especially when it clashes with the designer's ideas? Is that something which is followed I'm sorry. very much in the industry? Uh, yes, I, I think, um, you know, there are, I think one has to be aware of Vastu because I, I don't know how much people, Vastu has become a trend, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. There is a logic to the, it's, it's not entirely a pseudoscience. There is some rationale behind it. Uh, there are many other such sciences. There is, there is German, see, there is uh, Feng Shui, and they all have their own logics. And those logics are, and you read into it, you will find a certain logic. But fundamentally, Vastu was meant for buildings made in isolation. It was made, meant for temples. It was meant for uh, courtyard homes. It was meant for palaces. Who were building on virgin ground. Now, when you are building in a what I, what, you know, when you're building in a city like Delhi, where you're building on a plot, how can you say one plot is good and the other plot right next to that is not? Mm -hmm. You know, it can't be that. So I, I think people often 
use Vastu and, and you can always download a com- an app on your mobile phone called Vastu Compass. And I find that major- the majority of people prophesizing Vastu or following and you can test it. You can just write it down on a piece of paper so what they've said and write it down again or for the other couple of things you can pretty much overlay it and see it matches with the Vastu Compass. I think the understanding of energies of a space are deeper. It is related. It is, it's just like wearing a, a sort of ring, you know, the, the, uh, uh, a, a piece of jewelry. Different things, different micro energies react with different people differently, right? So we are all made of elements and that's how it is. It is important to incorporate them. There are consultants who do that specifically and they are professionals who can be engaged. And like you would be a professional to uh, in in interior design or in architecture, there are they are spe- they are specialized professionals in their field, and they're part of their own uh, the their their service to their profession is to keep upgrading their own knowledge base. The same applies for you. Don't try and learn it yourself. I think find a person who you can refer to for, it. and ensure you find the right person who's not just using a vastu compass and fooling you. I think Alok, uh, you must have learned a lot from what Akshat has just informed us about Vashti Sastra. I'm going to move on to a question on Humayun's tomb and Sundar nursery. They've been restored by the Aga Khan Trust. Do you think similar restoration efforts should be made for the Red Fort, uh, Old Fort and other monuments? Is that a question directed to me? I guess they are asking, um, he's asking for your opinion. And so it's just to say, do you think they are good enough, restored good enough, or they need better restoration? I think everything needs to be better, right? (laughs) You can do the best thing that you, you can make your best effort and turn around and you will still find, if if you are a good professional, you will find reason to better it. So uh, knowing a little bit about how these places were restored, I think it's a good starting point. It's a good, uh, just as I would say, our Jodhpur project is a good starting point, just as I would say, Thunder is a starting point. It, you start at a place and based on certain parameters, limitations, your own abilities, you reach a certain, you reach somewhere. The, you have to, you you have you you judge a project based on what you see. That's what you and I can judge it as you are not involved. But as people who are involved, they know how far they've stretched a the buck. They know how far they've stretched time. Uh, and yes, and I and I think if if a good professional is involved and or a seat or and good uh, values are involved, then you will always look back and at at anything and say, oh, I could have done it better. Nothing's ever good as we want it to be as good as we want it to be. Absolutely. I keep on hearing you reiterate, you know, the the certain values of quality and uh, your own passion or your own ideas, finding enough confidence to apply that. Uh, There are, uh, there's a question on, uh, on the, it's a technical question. So in historical times, havelis and monument walls were built using natural material. Can such walls be built in these times and how much would it cost? Mm. I think, um, I think the first question I will ask is, is it relevant to make something as it was made many years ago today? Mm-hmm. Do I need to make a Haveli today? Mm-hmm. Why should I make a Haveli today? Mm-hmm. Is it relevant any longer? Would you want to go and live in a cave? We started out living in caves. Would you want to do that today? Um, so if there is something that ha- that does not have a mainstream requirement for society, I don't think one should waste energy, time and resource on it because it is, it may be coming out of your pocket or your client's pocket, but eventually it is a universal resource. You know, um, you have to understand the need to change patterns of consumption. Having said that, to answer your question directly, material in today's 
day and age is available on volume. Labor is available on volume. So, and the old buildings used to consume, used to have a cheaper pallet of materials, but the volume of material they would consume would be significantly higher. So, and as time has moved on, newer materials are processed through industrial production, therefore reducing waste and increasing the efficiency in their manufacture. Um, as time moves on, the efficiency of, the, of workmanship and craftsmanship and labor in that in, in new age or newer materials, such as, and by new I categorize concrete as that as well, has been optimized. That is not the same for an old technique or an, or an old material. So it will always cost you a lot more. How much more is really up for debate? If I was to give you an example of the overall Calcutta project, no matter how efficiently we used our computers and machines and whatnot, it still cost us three times per square foot when compared to the overall New Delhi, which is a much more cutting edge building. So there is, here you compare a building which is only which was built in the 70s refurbished and you compare a building that was built in the 1800s refurbished what we spent on a 3 lakh 50 thousand square foot project is less than what we are now going to spend on a 70 thousand square foot project that's the difference is it worth it you know Akshay, there are many many questions which are technical questions and i hope we will be able to uh, take them on later after the sessions but there's one personal question which i think we should end it with and it's well it's not for pers so personal it's about your education um the participant wants to know whether uh, whether i think okay how much uh, do you relate with the uh, with what you learned in london and um the what you and the experience working experience that you had over there and what you are doing now in India. So do you think so, that has been? Well, the, I, think, I think there are many dimensions to that question. And I mean, any answer has a reason. You know, that's why I, I think when you're in school, they ask you, what do you think and why? You know? So I think the why is as important as what. Um, Yes, that you know when you study, there are there are many aspects to it. The first is your own sense of rigor. How hard working am I? How committed am I? Let us say that you are a hundred on that, one hundred. Everyone are equally hard working and committed. Second is your own inherent talent and skill, um, which I think can be taught to yourself. That depends again on how hard working and committed you are. Character. You know, your own strength of character is something you either have or you don't have. You know, that's character that makes you work hard or commit. When you go abroad, you and you, you are set amongst a group of people who are usually, who have had, who don't have to study in college after they're 18 or 17 when they graduate. And their parents are not paying for the education. It's more often than not, the government is paying for the education which they pay off for the rest of their life or for many, many decades. It's not given to them for free. We tend to think that, oh, my batchmates are studying on subsidy. They're not. They've been given the money at that time, but they have to pay it off with a significant student loans are have an incredible amount of interest associated with them abroad. Um, so they are definitely more motivated in that sense than most people studying abroad uh, from who are from the subcontinent. So what you learn is a work ethic you learn that look everyone's equal no one's going to be treated special you're going to have to work equally hard and you're going to get called out on merit because there is no such thing as a free lunch abroad so it make it builds your work ethic and your appreciation of what you're learning because everyone's in class all the time no one's bunking class uh, and the next is when you're there it gives you the opportunity for exposure so when you're there, when I was there, I would take all the free time I had to travel. Um, whether it was my own money or any such thing, whether it was sleeping in the, you know, sleeping in a bus uh, while I was traveling <coughs> or, or flying, whatever it took, it was to make the most of the, 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 the years I spent there, which meant in terms of work, in terms of 
studies in terms of learning uh, and ability and skill set but also in terms of exposure so i would get out every weekend to see i had a list of 400 buildings that i wanted to see and i think i managed to touch about 360 i missed 40 which i covered in subsequent years and that becomes a part of your uh, uh, you know because travel and travel changes you you know as you travel no matter how you travel you will you will get scars you will get scarred by seeing things you will get scarred because you will get into arguments into scuffles you will you make friends you will make people who you may meet you you know you, but but those scars that you that you acquire through travel are always scars which are intense and they change you and they change you in a beautiful way uh, and i i think you 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 learn how to cook you know i didn't know how to cook i i don't cook anymore i never used to cook but I learned a little. I learned how to make egg and toast when I was abroad, you know, um, <laughs> which I which I never made when I was in when I was working and studying here. So wow, that sounds really exposure. Cool. Very exciting, Akshat. I can see that um, probably many of them listening to you are already already thinking about if they were to have the opportunity to go out. But as an educator, I must also say, those of you, whether you travel out or whether you study here, it is all about what Akshat is saying that, you know, you, you, you do the same, you have the same discipline about wanting to learn, to be focused, to be disciplined. You can do the same things while you're here or whether you are there. You can still travel in India. I mean, travel out, meet people. These are all experiences which enrich you as designer, as a professional and as a human being. Uh, we are really at the end of our session and Akshat, I have to thank you for really opening up your heart and your, uh, your every bit of knowledge that you have. I'm sure it's, there's still a lot more. There are many, many more questions I would like to get, get them across sometimes and be able to you know, uh, answer this to your participants at some point. So we have a poll over here. We'd like you to please answer that. What do you think uh, we should do next? Of course, many of you have been attending, uh, uh, coming back to us again and again. Thank you for that. We love seeing you over here. Uh, please look at all the answers and tick mark the areas that you would really like to um, have the webinar on next time. Please go ahead and mark that. And I must say that I can see that Akshat isn't very much older to you guys, but, um, and that's, that's the reason they seem to be listening to you a lot, I think. Um, and probably they believe in your experience to be much more, uh, you know, more contemporary. And I'm sure uh, this, is, this is something they would like to, your work must have inspired them a lot. I hope in future we should be able to bring them more designers and people who have who have developed their value system based on what their thinking has been, what their experiences have built up. So we look forward to your answer on this poll. And um, so there we are. Okay, there, there is a huge number wanting to look at technology in interior space. Um, that's, a tech, that's a topic people are interested in. The next interest is on upscaling your home aesthetics and an equal number in uh, sustainability and interiors, leadership and communication and design. So, well, we are we're really happy to get this result from you and we'd like to be able to uh, bring these sessions to you as soon as possible. There's another one, which is, which we are not going to wait for, but you, I would be happy to have you mark these. Would you like to hear more about our programs? So we bring this to you from JS Institute of Design in Delhi. We are uh, having an interior design program, but more than that, we are interested to bring knowledge, exposure, and discovery of design to you guys. Help us understand what you want, and we'll be happy to do that. So please, let's hear, would you like to know more about our programs? And Akshat, once again, I want to thank you. I hope to see you once the lockdown is over, and I'm sure many students still want to know a lot more from you. So we'll figure out how that can be done, but 
this has been a, an excellent evening. I think many of us who, who are not exactly just from interiors have learned a lot too. So if you bring you some more in webinar, probably I can get a degree in interior design. <laughs> this is just joking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you for having you. me. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And um, uh, please remember all that Akshat has talked about, not only through the question and answers, but through his projects. And if you want to know more, uh, put down your questions and we will be in touch with Akshat Bhatt, principal founder of Architecture Discipline. Thank you. Uh, please don't forget to fill up a survey at the end of the session. As you click the chat, as you leave this meeting, there's a survey for you guys. Please fill it up. We look forward to hearing from you. Bye-bye. Thank you.